Okay, good evening. Uh, I'm Mary Sue Lanigan with the Michigan Parkinson Foundation, and I want to welcome you to our Tuesday evening virtual support group meeting. Um, we are really pleased tonight to be able to uh, present, I think, a very informative program, patient-centric medical management, home health, private duty services, and transitional care. Uh, we are delighted to have Julie Brohard, who is a social worker, and she's the transitional case manager at Corso Care. She's going to give a presentation about you know, when do you bring in um, uh, health care aides, nursing care into your home? When is it time to think about perhaps moving to a community or a skilled nursing uh, community? And she is going to be able to answer all those questions. So I'm going to turn this over to Julie. Julie, thanks so much for being with us this evening. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I wish, of course, we could all be in person. Um, so I'm still getting used to the this Zoom um, um, so, you know, type of support. But um, I'm really happy to be here um, to discuss a topic that I, I'm very passionate about, which is guiding families. Um, the Today, I was asked to talk about patient-centered medical management and how to use a collaborative approach with your medical team. So I know we've all heard that term of patient-centered, but what is it? And of course, how does that apply to you as a patient? Um, let me see if I can get this, here we go. Okay, um, so patient-centered care essentially um, is where you, the patient, are in the driver's seat. Care is focused on, you, on the whole person. So that's your physical, your emotional, your spiritual, your environment, and your social needs. And it's where you are collaborating with a team of your providers such as like your, your PCP, your neurologist, psychologist, physical therapist, et cetera. Um, but most importantly, it's where decisions are made by you, um, with you, and based on your values and your preferences. So the overall goal of patient-centered care is to empower you, the patient, to be active participants in your care. So I bring that, that definition um, because it's a really important piece of, um, of why I'm here and which is to empower you with education and information to make you an active participant in your care. While your providers, while your providers of course, are there to inform, advise and support, as we, need, as we know, ultimately it's up to you, the patient, to determine the course of action that your doctor is gonna take. So my goal for you is to, is to help you become well-informed and educated on your options so that you can make the best decisions that you can. Um, so that's kind of where I come in as a transitional um, care navigator, or as some people call it, a transitional care, care manager. Um, so I have kind of a, a unique position um, with Corso Care as, my, as a transitional care navigator. And my role is um, is to help guide families from the various points Eric? of their oh. um, transition from, for example, from the hospital home to a hospital to a rehab facility, um, possibly back home with home health care, and helping them um, determine of which level of care is most appropriate for them and how to support them at home, um, or again, at various levels so that their care is appropriate and safe. As we know, this is a very crazy healthcare system that we're navigating these days, especially in COVID. Um, so which makes kind of my role ultimately um, a very important piece. Um, so transitional care um, is kind of a newer concept. I don't know if, if many of you have had that experience before um, with case managers or a um, possibly through your insurance company. Um, but transitional care is where, like I said, we do, our goal is to help empower you with information. Um, I want you to know your options. I want you to be able to um, understand what your rights are, understand where your insurance, what, what is available to you through your insurance, um, what is private pay, and ultimately the questions to be able to ask your medical team and prepare you for, to be an active participant. Um, so as a transitional care, our current model through Corso Care um, is where we are 
we are aligned with a um, home health care agency um, called Corso Care, as well as hospice. So we offer both home care and hospice. And so um, we walk along with you with during that pathway of getting you on our services. Um, so uh, what's important for us is to look at um, under, helping you understand the, the, your diagnosis, making sure that you understand um, some of the warning signs or red flags of possibly an exacerbation of your illness. Um, we look at your medication understanding. Um, we help you organize your thoughts and um, any concerns that you wanna discuss during future appointments. Um, and then ultimately we also help support through um, with outreach to your primary care physician. So, um, so my, like I said, my position um, with Corso Care is kind of a unique, it's something that um, is, I haven't seen a lot with other home care agencies um, because we do see that, um, that important piece, that missing piece of being able to help guide patients and families through the various um, uh, touch points in our healthcare system. So um, what I wanted to do is, is to talk further about what are those different, um, what are those different touch points um, and, and to help make sure that you are well informed of what is home care, um, the qualifications of home care, um, when that might be applicable to you, um, and some of the misconceptions that we might have um, is um, with what home care is, as well as answer questions about what are um, what can you get at a rehab facility versus an independent living facility, assisted living, et cetera. So let's kind of talk about what is home care. Um, so home care is a covered benefit through your insurance, and it's where um, we are allowed to come in per Medicare guidelines um, for those that are deemed to be homebound. So meaning that it would be ta a tasking um, effort or counterproductive for you to be able to go to an outpatient provider for these services. So you are um, in which you would need someone to help support you to get to an outpatient appointment. Um, so home care is a short-term solution. So most individuals um, are on service anywhere between four to six weeks, sometimes shorter, sometimes longer. Um, again, it, again, it is individualized to each person. Um, home care is where the insurance allows us to, to send out a nurse, physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, dietitian, and social worker. Um, each, like I said, each individual um, treatment plan is individualized and it is overseen through your doctor. And in many cases, that could be your neurologist or your primary okay. care physician. Um, and and, um, no, and uh, currently, the, the current slide is showing some of the various home care triggers. So people often ask me, um, wh what are some reasons I might need home care? Um, so as you can see, one of the, one of the, the biggest points, um, so skilled nursing, for example. Um, skilled nursing um, often is, is uh, added to somebody's order set when they're coming back from a hospital or rehab. Sometimes that might be because there are some medication changes, you've been started on something or stopped something, um, for lab draws or possibly a urinalysis, wound care, IV management, um, sometimes the nurse will come in if we're having some, some challenges with, with even some of our vitals or blood pressure management. Um, physical therapy and occupational therapy, um, again, often come in sometimes after a rehab or a hospital stay. It's where when we've ever, when we, whenever we see a change in someone's mobility or, or uh, strength training balance or what we call as like a gait. Um, so, uh, so for example, that could be where um, you're having a harder time getting up from like a sitting to a standing position, um, possibly um, getting, you know, some of your care of your tasks of daily living have become more challenging. So um, dressing, bathing, or toileting has become more of a challenge for you. Um, that's where also the physical therapist can come in, occupational therapy can come in um, to evaluate you in your environment. So home care is very unique in that sense because not only are they providing you with that type of um, the exercise support, um, but they get, to, they get the unique perspective of seeing you inside your home. So then now they're able to look at um, 
possible areas that could be a fall risk for you. So, um, you know, different rugs in the various rugs that might be on the floor. Um, and they're also able to see you um, trying to do some of the tasks in your home. So looking at, you know, the um, looking at your, you know, you getting up from your couch or from your chair, you being able to go in and out of your bathroom and being able to also make some recommendations for, um, for appropriate equipment. So, so such as like a grab bar in your bathroom around your toilet or in your shower. Um, social work and speech therapy. Speech therapy um, is, uh, there's two different avenues or two different things that we might consider for speech. Sometimes it's when somebody's having some challenges with swallowing. So that could, um, so if that's been a, um, sometimes related of course to our Parkinson's. Um, the other part of speech therapy that can be beneficial is to help working with somebody from more of a cognitive um, standpoint. So um, if there's been any changes in someone's mental status, um, speech therapy also has shown to be a great benefit as well. And then of course, you know, my favorite um, as is a social worker um, is also having a social work support to be able to come in as well. Um, so social workers, of course, we can be look, talking to you and, and help getting you connected um, for some longer term support whenever there's been um, to talk about even some, some changes in your, again, the overall changes of your adjustment to your, um, to your illness. Um, sometimes that might also be getting you connected to um, some uh, community resources as well um, for, for long-term care, for equipment. Uh, we might be looking at other community organizations and that's where we, we are great at coming in and helping support you. Um, part of the, um, other than home care, one of the other things that we look at um, at certain times might be um, palliative care hospice. Um, palliative care is kind of a, um, a newer term in some capacities, um, but um, so palliative care is considered a, the focus is gonna be symptom management. Um, some people get palliative care in the hospital where they might have somebody come in that's talking to them about what are their goals of care. Sometimes those conversations also um, include someone's advanced care directive, um, as well as you know, what is important to you with your medical, you know, for your future care needs. So for example, do you want CPR? Um, do you want dialysis, et cetera? But the focus of palliative care has been around for a long time um, under, under hospice. So while palliative care is now in existence to be offered in conjunction with home care, so you can have home care as well as palliative care for your symptom management in which they will be focusing on pain management for you or symptom management while you're working with home care for curative care. Um, where there is also hospice is inclusive of palliative care as well. But in that capacity, it's gonna be for individuals that, um, that are no longer seeking curative care. Um, for those that are seeking hospice care, we are allowing nature to take um, its course. And, and um, but with the focus of, again, with, with that symptom management, um, um, along with some of the other um, supports in, involved with hospice. Um, hospice care, um, again, is one of the big, sometimes I call it the, the dirty word of medical care. Um, nobody likes to talk about it. Nobody wants to hear that word. Um, but hospice is actually a, an amazing program. I've personally, my family's personally had the experience of hospice um, with um, two family members now within the last few years. Um, hospice is, um, it, it is a covered benefit again through your insurance. Um, it is for those that have a prognosis of six months or less um, based on your chronic illness. Um, and it is, a, it is considered all inclusive um, for your medical care. So what that means is that it includes all of the cost of your medications, your equipment. Um, it also includes um, your, uh, your nurse, you get an aid that's included as well, social work, bereavement support for up to 18 months. Um, there are volunteers that come out. Um, sometimes that can also be inclusive of a dietitian and possibly physical therapy and occupational therapy as well. 
in some cases. Um, incontinence supplies is a really big one because we know how expensive those can be. Um, and, um, and again, the focus of, of hospice is that symptom management as well, but we're no longer looking to go back and forth to the hospital. Um, hospice is for someone that is wanting to maintain or stay in the home for as long as they can um, with, the, with all of their symptoms and their illness to be, um, for, uh, to be managed in the home with the medical director or the overseeing uh, provider from hospice. So, so hospice is, a, is really, it's a, it's a great avenue. People, unfortunately, um, tend to get on hospice um, within, you know, within that, that last 48 hours that they're with us. Um, but the intention of hospice is actually um, more of a long-term solution for someone to, again, maintain and to be in their home, in their environment with their families. Um, I do a lot of hospice coordination. Um, hospice can be done in the home. It can also sometimes be done outside of the home in, um, in various independent living or assisted livings. Um, sometimes we even coordinate um, a respite stay for someone, which is considered, which is a short-term stay in a, um, again, in a, in a, um, in a um, assisted living or nursing home. Um, where someone is able to get hospice care support um, because the one part that hospice does not cover, um, just to make sure everyone un is understands, hospice does not cover room and board and it does not cover 24 hour care. So hospice is meant to be a supplement um, to your current um, supportive environment, but it's not meant to take over all of that care. So sometimes, um, sometimes that can be managed by family members and friends, and other times um, that would, you know, people um, that would be something that you can um, go to a facility to help with that level of support as well. Um, um, one of the big questions I get a lot um, is is talking about I'm in the or from families they call some families um, about their loved one being in the hospital, and I know before the before the presentation started, um, we were chatting briefly just about some of the challenges right now with COVID and um, that families and patients are having about getting, it, getting their loved ones into a, into a skilled nursing facility or a rehab post-hospitalization. And I think it's important um, for everyone to know what are those different terms and why is that important to know? Um, because your rights as patients and what the insurance um, insurance covers is um, is a part of that a, a part about some of those differences. Um, so skilled nursing, um, sometimes it's called a skilled nursing facility. Sometimes it's also referred to as a subacute rehab. Um, that is something that is covered through Medicare um, through your Medicare your Part A benefit. Um, and what that looks like is um, you do have 100 days um, through Medicare for your support for your skilled nursing or, or up to 100 days, I'm sorry, for your skilled nursing or rehab, depending on which of the disciplines is primary to your diagnosis for being in the hospital. Um, not everybody qualifies for skilled nursing or rehab, um, but what they look at for that is um, is there a need that can't be covered safely in the home um, with your discharge? So for some people, if they have um, some, some extensive wound care or IV medication that can't be administered in the home, um, that, is, that is, for example, a reason why somebody might go to a skilled nursing facility. Um, when we look at someone to go to a rehab facility, a lot of times that's because there's been a significant change in someone's prior level of function. So again, before the hospitalization, before the, the change in your, um, for the, before you went to the hospital for whatever reason that was, you were possibly walking with your walker or you were walking independently and now you're unable to do that safely. That might qualify you for a, um, for a short-term stay in a, in a rehab. I, um, the difference between a subacute rehab and a um, home care, for example, as we talked about, is home care also does rehab. The difference is in the difference is is the frequency 
and the duration. Um, so for example, um, someone going to a subacute rehab, most individuals stay approximately 15 days to 30 days or so. Like I said, Medicare does cover up to 100 days um, a year, but that is typically not um, something that occurs um, at the same timeline that might take the course over various hospitalizations throughout the year. So most individuals stay for as long for about that timeline. Um, it is based on insurance about medical necessity and they, the facility does work with your insurance to see as long as you need to be there um, before they will make recommendations for discharge. Um, the benefit of going to skilled nursing or again that subacute rehab facility is, um, is the access of 24 hour nursing um, as well as the, um, the intensity of the rehab that's available to you. Um, so physical therapists and occupational therapists typically will work with the patient um, every day. Um, so approximately two, like two and a half hours, three hours a day, possibly an hour per discipline. Um, where home care um, comes out for, uh, again, a, the maximum or approximately about twice a week, for example, for physical therapy and occupational therapy. Again, all of that is something that's individualized and it's um, determined um, when, when the, the clinician comes out and starts working with you and makes that determination with your doctor as well. Um, but for those that would most benefit from, um, from a frequency like a subacute rehab, um, typically, that is where that that recommendation might come from from your from your medical team, um, because they feel that you would most benefit from that intensity, with the goal of cure with that curative goal of getting back to your prior level of function, which again was where you were at before you got into the hospital in the first place. So that term again is subacute rehab or skilled nursing facility. Um, the other term that might come up um, is what's called an, an inpatient rehab. Inpatient rehab um, is actually um, typically in the floor of a hospital. Um, it is can be a little bit more challenging to get into or to qualify for that because it is based on certain diagnoses um, or for a qualifying stay. But the difference is, um, is again, the, uh, the intensity. To qualify for an acute rehab stay, um, you ha would have to be able to have the endurance um, to participate in therapy approximately three hours a day. Um, that can be very, very challenging, of course, for all of us or for any of us. Um, and so if, at that point, the medical team might make a recommendation for a longer program at that subacute rehab instead. Um, so that is, of course, something you know, to consider, to look at, to talk to your medical team about if you're ever hospitalized so to see if, if you would benefit and if you, um, you know, for that, for that acute rehab stay. Um, the other term that might come up um, is what's called an LTEC. An LTEC stands for a long-term acute care facility. And that is essentially a hospital inside of a hospital in some cases. Um, so a, normal hospital that you and I might go to like Beaumont Royal Oak or St. Joe's um, is what's called an acute hospital. An acute hospital, our goal there is to diagnose, to stabilize, and then to discharge so that your, your treatment and your, um, your treatment at that point can continue um, and your healing. Um, some individuals require hospital level care for a longer period of time. And at that point, that is where that, that other term, um, long-term acute care facility might come in. So that is where a patient might require hospital level care for 30 days or more um, for Medicare guidelines. Um, so that can be, for example, for patients that might um, be on a ventilator um, uh, or are having some significant medical care needs where they need the, the access to the specialist or might have to go back to surgery, ex, et cetera. So, so again, I just wanted to kind of, I wanted to bring up those different terms in case that is something that you um, come across in the future so that you have a working knowledge um, so to ask the questions that you have that, or that you need to. 
Um, oh, let me keep moving on here. Okay. Um, so bringing up some, again, some of these important things, you know, why am I talking about this? Um, it is so that you have the education to be an active participant in your care and that patient-centered care. Um, I, other ways that we, to become an active participant, of course, um, the important things are staying on top of your appointments, um, anticipating any challenges or barriers that you might come across with getting to your appointments, communicating with your providers if there's ever been any changes in your health um, or your medications, making sure that you're staying in communication with your family members about your goals of care. Um, I, of course, would be happy to talk more um, about advanced care planning and the importance of that too uh, during your question and answer session. Um, and then also making sure that you don't assume that your doctors have all of the updates on your care. Um, so, you know, be responsible for that. If there, if one doctor, if you went to your primary care physician and they changed something on you, um, making sure that, um, that you are communicating that to all the other doctors that might be involved in your care. So never, never assume that everybody involved is getting, getting that information. Um, bring your discharge paperwork with you to your appointments, make sure that all of your doctors are, are informed of any changes that have happened. Um, technology does fail us, of course, sometimes. And so not everybody, you know, can't assume that everyone's getting that information that they should be. Um, and, and most importantly, which is this last slide here, is making the most of your time with your doctor. Um, I found these, these amazing sheets um, that I wanted to share. And if anyone's interested, I can um, pass that on as well um, through NIH. But it's where you're able to um, document some of uh, preparing yourself for your appointments by documenting some of your concerns, by documenting any changes that you want to discuss with your doctor. Um, I, know, I don't know about you, but I know when I get into my doctor's office, I, I essentially go blank. And when my doctor, my doctor asks me, have any other questions or concerns, of course, my answer is always no, everything's great. But I know, and then I'll get to my car and I'll say, oh, I forgot to ask about this or I forgot to mention this. Um, so I, so these are um, some great sheets, some helpful ways to be able to help prepare you for your doctor's appointments. So again, that you can make the most out of your visits and um, the most out of your time with your doctor. And again, to, as a way to becoming an active participant in your care. So hopefully some of this, this information was helpful for you. My favorite part about um, being, being able to speak at the last, um, the last uh, uh, Parkinson's uh, class was being able to do the question and answer sessions. Cause to me, again, that's the most important thing is being able to guide families. So um, if it's okay with you, I'd love to get to know everybody that's on the call and, and be able to learn from each other and our experiences and see what I can do to help you. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.